So without further ado, let me begin with the topic at hand. Notwithstanding the widely held assumption that the representation of human beings is forbidden in Islam, figural images nevertheless have played an important role within Islamic cultural and artistic traditions from the 8th century until today. From kings and maidens painted in fresco on the walls of early palaces and bathhouses in the Arab Middle East, as you can see here, to kingly figures in audience or at battle as depicted in medieval ceramics, as is the case here, to early modern Persian and Turkish illustrated manuscripts boasting extensive pictorial programs, images of human beings have fulfilled a number of functions for both private and public audiences. At times, such images could act as mirrors into contemporary social and religious circumstances, while at others they could provide wishful projections of political and amorous conquests. Regardless of their different media and viewing contexts at different times and places, such depictions pay tributes, tribute to man's urge to visualize his world in his own image. Within the history of Islamic pictorial arts, images of the Prophet Muhammad likewise have played a significant role in the construction of identity for both members of ruling political elites as well as participants in a variety of faith communities. Many paintings of Muhammad were produced especially between 1300 and 1600, a period of major political and religious transition across the Islamic world. During this time, a number of powerful Turkic and Persian dynasties emerged, claiming a sacred mandate to imperial rule thanks to their adherence to and promotion of the Islamic faith. In their symbolic formulations of rightful rulership, royal patrons and artists were clearly inspired by the model of the prophet, who was portrayed in both texts and images as a divinely anointed monarch and archetypal ruler worthy of emulation. Although Muhammad was indeed a mortal man and temporal ruler emerging in the full light of history, it is widely believed that his prophetic rank and his proximity to God nevertheless endowed him with trans-temporal dimensions and superhuman abilities, including the capacity to receive revelation, to perform miracles, to ascend into the heavens, and to speak with God directly and without intermediary. For these reasons, Muhammad also was imagined through a variety of symbolic abstractions, in particular word and light analogies, as we'll see today, that aimed to promote his pre-existential nature and his ability to spread enlightenment to mankind through his unequaled access to the realm of the divine. By means of such metaphors, Muhammad was deemed the ultimate source of authority and spirituality and hence was deployed as a point of reference within discourses on religious and political supremacy. He also was envisaged, envisaged as an ideal conduit to experiencing the heavenly realms as found within Sufi or mystical practices of devotional prayer and contemplation. These many images of Muhammad, as you can see in this uh, short list, as a mortal ruler, as an invoked presence, as a radiant messenger, a pivot of truth and a channel for unity with God, revealed the divergent ways in which Muhammad could be imagined in the eyes of his beholder, depending on need and desire. And what's more, such images took on a distinctive visual turn as patrons and artists alike harnessed the expressive power of the visual mode in order to craft and communicate a vision of a prophetic past within the lens of the present. Although two or three paintings of Muhammad dating to the first half of the 13th century are still extant today, the story of images of the Prophet begins in earnest right around 1300, that is, after the Mongol conquests of Eurasia and the sacking of the famous Abbasid Library in Baghdad in 1258. Although it is impossible to know what, if any, depictions of the Prophet might have been included in the manuscript holdings of this famous library prior to its destruction, what is nevertheless clear is that paintings of Muhammad began to appear in illustrated manuscripts that were commissioned by Muslim political elites who ruled in the wake of the Mongol invasions, so after 1260. Before 1260, it's just a big gap. We don't know what was there. 
Having settled in Arab, Persian, and Turkic lands and largely embraced the Islamic faith by 1300, these cultured patrons became some of the greatest supporters of the arts of the book, through which the biography of the Prophet and early Islamic history could be taught and passed down through generations of believers. Images of Muhammad, especially those produced in Persian lands, were not intended as mere visual aids in the supposedly objective narration of history. To the contrary, they promoted the Prophet as a repository for historic continuity and an argument in favor of traditionalism for an otherwise foreign ruling class that sought to construct a corporate sense of superiority and legitimacy. For these reasons, the earliest surviving images of the Prophet depict him according to visual models that promote temporal authority and sacral rulership. This is especially the case for the painting that you see here, which is included at the very beginning of Al-Varavini's Marzuban Nameh, made in Baghdad in 1299. The Marzuban Nameh is known as the Book of the Margrave, and it's a collection of moralizing fables uh, written in, in Persian. Along with figural portraits of the text's author and his royal patron, the painting of the prophet shown on the screen is one of only three illustrations in the manuscript, all of which essentially form part of the text's prologue, praising both regal and authorial excellence. So what we have then, if you think about how you open the book, you would have the illustration of the prophet, the patron, and then the author of the text, and that is it. So it's really front matter that's uh, in praise of some major heroes. And here's a detail of the painting. Although the painting was the target of a much later iconoclastic act, probably around the 18th or the 19th century, somebody came in and scratched out uh, Muhammad's face, the prophet was originally depicted with visible facial features. He sits cross-legged and enthroned, wearing his large white overcloak over his blue robe. Two flying angels, here and here, whose faces have been scratched out much later as well, fly above him while holding a fluttering ribbon. The angel on the right appears to pour light rays upon Muhammad, right here, while the angel on the left seems to anoint him with a flask containing heavenly liquid or scent. So here is a bottle of anointment. Other figures sit or stand around the prophet. However, as is the case for Muhammad, their faces, and in particular their eyes, were also damaged at a later date. Now this is really unfortunate because it's hard to reconstruct the development of prophetic iconography when you've got these a posteriori defacements. The Persian text immediately above and below the image describes the prophet as emitting radiance, much like a torch of light, and his two sandals as exuding the minty smell of the pennyroyal or black poly herb. The angels above him imbue him with the dual synesthetic attributes of numinous brilliant and uh, brilliance and fragrant aroma adding a layer to the prophet's features otherwise not visible upon first glance. In other words, light and scent. The petaled flowers and leaves in the foreground, moreover, may represent two penny royal flowers and thus offer a more olfactory evocation of Muhammad's prophetic aroma, itself praised in Alvarvini's text as quote unquote, a perfumed earth. And it, when you read Islamic spiritual texts, um, you will see that there's a concerted effort to describe Muhammad as sweet smelling and oftentimes he's described as smelling like a rose, as a, a, a ward or a gul. So the, the prophet as flower is pretty common as a metaphor. Even though the painting's composition and corresponding text suggests that the prophet's inner essence, perfumed and radiant, can be the subject of praise and mental picturing, it also pays heed to his more observable features. Indeed, Muhammad's physical features are extolled in two lines of Arabic poetry above and below the painting. Thus, based on the Persian text and the Arabic poem in honor of the Prophet, it is possible to suggest that this painting is intended to depict Muhammad among his companions who sit or stand in meditation of both his corporeal and non-corporeal attributes. The men's postures hint that they're engaged in spiritual reflection and in active prayer. Indeed, they all seem to look upwards towards a vision of the prophet, himself rendered sacrosanct by the angels hover hovering above him. So this man here has his 
hands raised up in prayer. Swaying back and forth, seated or raising their hands in prayer, the onlookers are engaged in a visually rapturous praise of the prophet, his physical characteristics, and his more spiritual attributes. Theirs is a devotional meditation that engenders a visualization of the prophet seated in majesty under the protection of angelic beings that anoint him with heavenly radiance and scent. The depiction of the prophet in the Book of the Margrave gains further layers of meanings when it is viewed in relationship to another painting that appears just five folios later within the same manuscript. In this scene, an enthroned ruler is depicted in the composition's center. He may represent Alvaravini's patron, a vizier active in the first decades of the 13th century, or else the unnamed sponsor who commissioned the author's text copied and illustrated in this manuscript of 1299. Although the sitter's identity remains unknown, he is clearly of high, perhaps even royal standing. Much more significantly, <coughs> the depiction of this royal audience shows undeniable parallels to the painting of the prophet within the same codex, within the same book. Indeed, here both rulers, Muhammad on the left and a princely figure on the right, sit enthroned in an outdoor setting. Both are surrounded by followers and officials standing and sitting in poses of respect. And as you'll notice, even these individuals have all been the target of an iconoclastic act. So it's not just the Prophet Muhammad, it's, it's all figures. Although both paintings resemble one another in their formal structure, figural composition, and the inclusion of a floral landscape, they also diverge in a number of important well, ways as well. For example, the kingly patron on the right is shown wearing a golden crown and a robe cross at the neck while well, his attendants likewise wear contemporary garb, as well as headgear and feathered caps, typical of the time that the manuscript was produced, so right around 1300. Additionally, in the foreground, two courtiers are depicted sitting on stools with pillows, here and here. From the crown to vestments and furniture, these many details were intended to reflect ceremonial fashions and effects current in elite circles at the time. On the other hand, in the painting of the prophet on the left, details are intended to suggest a distant past. The prophet wears his burda, or overcloak, and not a crown, so this white overcloak that goes over his head here. His companions wear variously colored turbans and not feathered caps. And they sit or stand in, on the ground without the aid of cushioned chairs. Without a doubt, the painting's artist here strove to represent the attire and etiquette current during the prophet's time, which would have been available to him through biographical and historical accounts. Conversely, the flying angels above Muhammad cannot be explained away as iconographic timepieces or else a pictorial exercise in accuracy to detail, I would imagine. Rather, their function transcends the purely mimetic to suggest a higher ontological plane of a, a consecrated being for the prophet. Indeed, in the Marzuban Name painting, as you can see here, as well as in others dating from the same period, Muhammad is depicted consistently enthroned as well as protected and anointed by angels. So here is another contemporaneous image of Muhammad, again seated, enthroned, with two angels hovering above him carrying a fluttering ribbon, surrounded by, here the first four rightly guided uh, caliphs, and again some flowers, probably roses, in the foreground. So this is a, a very traditional trope that we find in the earliest images of Muhammad. These iconographic details all contribute to what we might call a symbolic discourse of sacral kingship. Put more simply, Muhammad is visually imagined here as both king and prophet. He's enthroned like a king, but he's not just a king, he's angelically anointed. These paintings of Muhammad as a divinely mandated ruler, as found in the earliest surviving Persian paintings, must be interpreted in light of the particular cultural and political circumstances in Iran around 1300. At this time, 
the Ilkhanid rulers, foreigners of Mongol extraction who were beginning to convert to Islam, expended great efforts to fashion themselves as inheritors of the Islamic faith, as local dynasts ruling in the land of Iran, and as world leaders descending from the illustrious line of Genghis Khan. Their imperial ideology synthesized Islamic, Persian, and Mongolian ideas of rulership. Such, con such conceptual combinations can be found in a wide variety of textual materials, including historical texts, diplomatic letters, and even coins. To give just exa one example among many, a number of Ilkhanid rulers initiated their letters with the praise formula, quote, in the might of the everlasting heaven and in support of the Prophet Muhammad, the term for everlasting heaven meaning also God. So instead of in the name of Allah or Khuda, the term that's used for those of you who are specialists, the Mongolian term is Tengre or Tengeri, which is the heavenly being of, of the sky. So it's an interesting Mongolian Islamic fusion, the sky god and, and Muhammad. This Mongolian Islamic notion of God and his prophet can be seen as echoed within these paintings of Muhammad from the, this period in which the flying angels can be interpreted as carrying and transferring the might of a sky god to his chosen messenger. And it just so happens that this is the messenger of Islam. The pictorial rendition of sacred re uh, kingship in particular, the inclusion of winged angels holding ribbons above a monarch has a long history within pre-Islamic Iranian visual culture, both in elite private spheres as well as in the public domain. For example, a number of Sasanian silver plates and bowls of the eight, fourth to the seventh century, this is immediately pre-Islamic, depict investiture scenes in which a monarch sits enthroned while an angel or two fly above holding a fluttering ribbon. So here I show you an example uh, from the British Museum. This is a Sasanian silver dish where uh, the Sasanian monarch is seated, enthroned, as he's handed over the diadem of rulership, and an angel here flies above him holding a ribbon. So this is a paradigm with which we're now quite familiar. Additionally, royally sponsored Sasanian rock carvings use similar motifs within public space. Take, for example, Taki Bustan, which is located in the Iranian city of Kermanshah near the Iraqi border. This royal arch includes a number of carved reliefs. The lower recessed horizontal panel shows the Sasanian king Husra Anushirvan as a royal equestrian <coughs> mounted on his favorite horse. So here we have an equestrian scene. While the top register, and here's a detail right here, depicts the crowning ceremony of Khusrau as he stands in the center, flanked on the left by Ahura Mazda, the supreme deity of Zoroastrianism, and on the right by Anahita, the goddess of fertility, healing, and wisdom. Above these horizontal panels can be found two flying angels, each holding a diadem and fluttering ribbons. Here are our angels and they hold diadems and ribbons. So here's the diadem and a ribbon. This you can find, of course, in, in Roman triumphal arches uh, as well. In the Persian language, these ribbons are referred to as dastaj, which literally translates as purveyor of victory, victory granter of victory. Although Sasanian depictions of ribbons as part of imperial iconography antedate the arrival of Islam in Iran, the term dastaj continued to be used in Persian literature for centuries, most especially within Firdosi's Book of Kings, which was produced as an illustrated manuscript from the 1300s onward. In fact, <coughs> this image, which I showed you earlier, is in the Book of Kings. And in that text, the word dastar, or purveyor of victory ribbon, is used consistently. So there's a, a direct conjoining here of, of this older Iranian uh, rhetoric of rulership with illustrations of the Prophet Muhammad. Thus, the ribbon retained its role as a symbol of divine triumph, even when it became applied to the Islamic prophetic paradigm. The earliest surviving paintings of the Prophet Muhammad, from around 1300, 
clearly follow in the footsteps of the Persian iconography of sacral kingship, which was developed in both private and public spheres in Iran well before the advent of Islam. Images of cosmic rulers evidently endured well into the Islamic period, and such images, whether of a king or a prophet, tend to depict an exalted protagonist seated or standing who is invested with the right to temporal rule through God's angelic couriers bearing the dastar, a ribbon that functions as a visible material sign of the abstract concepts of sacred protection and divine triumph. As such, early paintings of Muhammad show the prophet imagined as a royal king bearing sacred attributes. And as you'll notice, these attributes essentially comprise non-physical external signs. In other words, you have ribbons, you have angels, you have flowers, but Muhammad's face is not manipulated. His, uh, his facial features are represented. So all of the signs of Muhammad's prophecy are external attributes. These symbols serve as visual stand-ins for Muhammad's appointment, protection, and triumph under God. Thus, in these earliest surviving paintings of Muhammad, he is shown as both a leader of his community and the last messenger of God. This conceptual composite of earthly and heavenly rule is without a doubt refracted by inherited Persian artistic motifs that aim to bolster an imperial ideology of sacred governance for an elite regime whose right to rule was doubly predicated upon the Persian kingly paradigm and the Islamic prophetic example. So here we see Persian kingships colliding with Islamic prophetic examples in, in image making. But then something happens and the prophet's facial features begin to disappear. Over the course of the 14th and 15th centuries, however, changes in prophetic iconography can be observed in Persian illustrated manuscripts commissioned by the rulers of Iran and Central Asia. At this time, representations of the prophet appear in the interstices between veristic representation and total abstraction, thereby revealing that portraiture in Islamic artistic practices provides a site of rich and complex meanings and not just material fact. Without a doubt, hybrid portraits, that is, they represent the prophet's physicality, but they also abstract it in some way. This is what I'm calling hybrid portraits. These hybrid portraits do not reproduce solely a corporeal likeness, but more often than not, they attempt to extend the boundaries of physiognomic specificity in order to convey, to remember, and to honor the more ineffable qualities of a person who was considered at once human and by the sacred. Such portraits include inscribed prayers, either below or above the prophet's facial veil, or else a bundle of flames in order to convey his primordial luminescence. So now he has a facial veil and his name uh, on his facial features, or he's shown with a flaming bundle. So we've got word and light analogies emerging over the 14th and 15th centuries. Although a number of paintings depict the Prophet Muhammad's facial features or provide him with a facial veil, others such as this unfinished tinted sketch showing the Prophet riding on the back of his human-headed winged horse named Burak reveal a different approach towards portraiture as early as 1400. This sketch includes the foundations of the painterly process. Red highlights are applied to the angel Gabriel's hair so here is the angel Gabriel leading Muhammad during his ascension. So his hair is picked out in red. Red is also applied to Muhammad's turban top, right here. There's Muhammad's turban top. Barak's saddle and crown. So this is Muhammad's human-headed steed, and his crown and his saddle are picked out in red. As well as the hair and crowns of the angels and the stars in the sky, which look like little gold balls. The artist has sketched out the faces of the angels, Gabriel and Barak. So you see facial features here and here. On the other hand, the Prophet Muhammad is neither provided with facial features such as a mouth, nose, or eyes, nor is his face left blank to be covered later with a painted veil. Rather, 
The oval of his face is inscribed with a written vocative statement reading Ya Muhammad, or O oh Muhammad. For those of you who can read Arabic, it's Ya and then Muhammad written here in this sort of blank canvas that is his face. This inscribed portrait contains an inscription that was not intended to be seen in the finished product. This is just a sketch. It's supposed to become a painting. This kind of representation renders the prophet as a bodily shell containing verbal components, giving him volume and presence through two very dissimilar techniques of depiction, namely that of physiognomic form combined with verbal enunciation captured in inscription. So we have form and text colliding here. The prophet's portrait, which consists of facial traits made up of letters calling out his name in the vocative, becomes activated by the pen and the voice of the artist, who seems to invoke a form through words or perhaps performs an oral prayer directed towards his messenger. It shows a clear connection between orality, faith, and portraiture, where the pious written and uttered word can be seen to awaken Muhammad's spiritual and perhaps even corporeal presence. <laughs> the artist's ardent desire to visualize the prophet through usually oral, but here inscribed invocation, gives this portrait the power to transform into a visible communion between the artist and the object of his affection. In fact, when a veristic form is deemed insufficient, the artist here opts for speech and its epigraphic rendition, both of which carry the potential for capturing a deeper essence scratched into the infrastructure of the painting itself. This sketch reveals the private undercover world of the artist, his world below the pigment. And here the artist uses verbal and pictorial motifs to call forth the presence of the prophet by means of his inscribed portrait, by means of an inscription meant to remain buried under paint. This artistic practice exemplifies some of the more unpremeditated unpre conceptions of personhood within the Islamic tradition, which manifest themselves here at the pictorial level. These include the life-inducing capabilities of oral prayer, known as dhikr in Arabic, as well as the artist's metaphysical concept of the prophet's being as transportable through time and space through the twin procedures of invocation and inscription. The Prophet's facial portrait, as articulated in the vocative Ya Muhammad, might be pushed aside as a solitary example of a hermetic practice particular to one artist active at the turn of the 15th century. However, the inscribed portrait of the Prophet as it appears in the sketch also occurs in a number of subsequent paintings, thus indicating that this kind of procedure was at the center of a religious pictorial tradition that has largely escaped scholarly notice thus far. So here I show you another example of this practice. Here is the Prophet Muhammad looking at his son-in-law Ali storm a, a fortress at Khaybar, and the pigments have fallen off of his white facial veil to reveal the underpainting or the drawing, and once again Muhammad's name is inscribed below the paint. Um, and the more you hold up these paintings to the light, the more you see that they have inscriptions below the veil. And even though we bemoan the fact that we lose pigments, it's actually very interesting when you have pigment loss because you get to see what's happening under, under the pigment. This practice of prophetic portraiture or icon making appears linked most especially to the growth of Sufism or uh, spirituality or devotionalism in Iran and Turkey over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries. Many medieval philosophers and mystics forwarded the idea that prayer can bring about existence and presence. For example, the famous 13th century Andalusian mystic Ibn al-Arabi states in his Bezels of Wisdom that, quote, prayer brings about the emergence from non-being, from Adam, to being, to wujud, by the activation of a mental image through devotional worship. In other words, when a man's desires are so intense, the emission of a pious sound can be seen as generating its visual counterpart. In a similar manner, the 14th century mystic Abdul Karim Ajilli 
also considers the Prophet Muhammad as an intermediary, as a wasita, between God and the world. In his book entitled The Complete or Perfect Man, Al-Insan Al-Kamil, Al-Jilli states that a devotee must summon the image of Muhammad as a visual aid in order to achieve spiritual realization. Indeed, only through the continuous recalling the dhikr of the mind's image through the uttered prayer can the believer find a compromise between non-existence and existence. That's the power of the word or the utterance. In both Ibn al-Arabi's and al-Jilli's writings, the consensus thus appears clear. The statement of a desire or the optative expression of an agent's wish can initiate a series of material images bound by the parameters of pious imagination. In such cases, the visual act of picturing Muhammad achieves its ontological realization only through the imaginative force of oral praise. So both text, word, and image have to come together. The verbalized figure of the prophet represents the product of the portraitist's intention and is not meant for the beholder of pictures. Western theories of viewer perception or reception cannot apply to portraits identified by infra-inscription, inscriptions below the pigment, as these were meant to remain imperceptible to those outside of the artist's private world. Nevertheless, other evidence that is now emerging suggests that portraits of the prophet transformed into a vehicle for the overt explicit and visible proclamation of his name as a counterpart for visualizing the entirety of his being. Such is the case with a corpus of paintings bearing supra inscriptions rather than infra inscriptions or the prophet's written name located on top of his facial veil instead of below it. Here, as you can see on the screen, the prophet's celestial ascension serves as a thematic medium for expressing praise, as it is included in a manuscript by Amir Khusro Dehlavi, another spiritualist. Muhammad sits on Burak with his palms outstretched in a position of prayer. So here is Muhammad on Burak and the angel Gabriel once again. Gabriel holds a green banner bearing inscriptions invoking God, Muhammad, and Ali. So this is a, a bit of a sectarian twist for those of you who are familiar with Shiism. Unfortunately, Burak's face has been scratched out at a later date. And here you see the damage. On the other hand, Muhammad's white facial veil has not been defiled. Instead, it seems like the owner of the manuscript, whether the patron who inherited it or the artist who repaired it, thought it unwise to erase the prophet's form, especially his head. Instead, an inscription praising the prophet by calling forth his name in the exclamatory Ya Muhammad seems to remedy the problem of the figure. So here it is, Ya Muhammad. Muhammad no longer exists here solely as defined by a physical form, but rather takes shape through his worshippers additive verbal veneration. His facial veil transforms into a tabula rasa for the expression of piety, and his quote-unquote portrait thus becomes the record of a written and oral tradition of prayer couched in pictorial terms. So we should start to think about prayer now in Islam as an imagistic or a pictorial tradition as well. The inscribed portrait of the prophet here incites oral prayer on the viewer's part and not just the artist's part a quality of portraiture that finds parallels in many other traditions as well. In a similar manner, the Ottomans, who seem to have been most active in including or adding supra-inscriptions to the prophets and other figures' veils, continued the practice of equating facial traits with inscribed verbal prayer. This procedure appears in a visionary painting of the prophet and Ali visiting their own graves in Medina at nighttime, along with their companions. So here's Muhammad, here's Ali, and here are their companions. Although the text seems to have been written around 1600, almost every illustration, including this one, bears a date of 1706. Although not visible in this image, 
The prophet's name was inscribed under his veil. You'll just have to take my word for it. Here's the Ya, for those of you who can see it, Ya Muhammad. While Ali's was restored in the vocative in a different ink over his veil. So here is Ya Ali, which was actually repaired later on. Unlike the prophet and Ali, other persons, such as Uthman and Omar in the lower right corner, simply have their names labeled on their turbans and not proclaimed on their faces. So here is, uh, right, Uthman, Omar, and others. So there's a sectarian twist to this that I won't get into, but it's prominent. This particular practice of adding a vocative statement above Muhammad's facial veil proves that the calling out of a prophetic presence does not just constitute part of the inceptive procedures of artistic creation. To the contrary, it also makes a strong case for the active response by the beholder of the image, whether artist or owner. In other words, the picture's viewer forges a dynamic and discursive relationship. That is, the painting tells a story in pictorial terms, while the viewer inscribes pious meaning into its pigments. In brief, the observer acts with and through the image. It's a dialectic. The sheer power of a viewer's inscribing of Muhammad's or Ali's names into their visual presence suggests that the written word, especially in its vocative form, has the conceptual potential of converting a physical frame into a live body imbued with spirit and presence through the medium of the participant's animated response. Such a phenomenon, is, or a belief, is attested to in textual sources as well. For example, the 15th century author Al-Jazuli, a very popular author in fact, notes in his prayer manual, The Proofs of Good Deeds, the Dala'il al-Khayrat, that a certain man felt the transfigurative intensity of writing down Muhammad's name. The man admits, quote, as soon as ever I wrote the name of Muhammad in a book, I spoke a blessing on him, and my Lord granted me what my eye had not seen nor ear heard ear heard, nor has occurred to the heart of a mortal man." End quote. For Jazuli then, the written word, coupled with a blessing or an oral speech act, transforms an epigraphic symbol into an instantaneous visionary experience of the totality of the prophet's being. In this way, letters transmute into the graphic mediators of an organism existing outside of time and space. This procedure of inscribing the prophet's name, both hidden under his veil or inscribed upon his facial veil, reveals the spiritual man's need to give material form to what I call a more metaphorical or metaphysical Muhammad. So those are the inscribed or word portraits of Muhammad. I'd like to now turn to the light portraits of the prophet. While inscribed portraits emerged during the 14th and 15th centuries, artists also began to devise new and rather nuanced visual metaphors that aimed to herald Muhammad's numinous nature in particular. This development can be traced in a variety of paintings, but perhaps nowhere best than in two related historical texts that include chapters narrating the biography of the prophet. The first of these texts is the Compendium of Chronicles, penned by the Ilhanid vizier Rashid al-Din and produced as an illustrated manuscript in the early 14th century. The second manuscript is the Quintessence, or Collection of Chronicles, written by Hafiz Abru, the official historian of the Timurid ruler Shahrukh, who requested that Rashid al-Din's earlier text be updated and completed. So in other words, this text right here of 1425 copies and updates this earlier text from about 100 year, years prior, and it even copies the pictorial program, which it then alters. So it's a really great barometer for seeing how images actually change over the course of the 14th century. As a result, the later Timurid illustrated manuscript of 1425 heavily draws upon its precursor in both its textual contents and pictorial images, both of which nevertheless have been altered in several notable ways that help us track how Muhammad 
came to be imagined and depicted differently over the course of the 14th and 15th centuries. Although one could in examine a broad range of paintings of the prophet in these two illustrated manuscripts, today I wish to focus on only two examples that help highlight more general trends vis-a-vis -vis the development of prophetic iconography. The two illustrations will be the birth of the prophet Muhammad and the beginnings of Quranic revelation known as Wahi. So let's begin with the birth um, scenes. In the Ilhanid illustrated manuscript of the early 1300s, the biography of the prophet begins with a description of the birth of Muhammad to his mother Amina. The section comprise, uh, comprises only two lines of text before the painting at the bottom of the folio and none thereafter, in which the author simply records a statement by the prophet's companions noting that Muhammad was born in Mecca during the year of the elephant. So here I show you, here is the, the title of the section and we've got two lines of text on Muhammad's birth and that is it. It's very, very short. The equivalent years are also provided in accordance with the regnal years of the Sasanian monarch Husra and Alexander the Great. No Islamic equivalent years provided, most likely because the lunar calendar had not yet been established. So the big question is really, when was Muhammad born? if there was no Islamic calendar at this time. The textual section on the Prophet's birth is thus exceedingly brief. Devoid of particulars and explanations, its only concern consists in establishing the accurate year of Muhammad's birth per two of the major calendars in operation at the time. Zooming in to the painting here, despite the brevity of the textual account, the painting nevertheless expands the narrative of Muhammad's birth by offering visual details that help fill in the gaps left by the text's overwhelming silence. <coughs> Here, in the horizontal register central bay, Amina, Muhammad's mother, is covered in a sheet as she reclines on a pillow and as a midwife and other servant ladies tend to her. So here's Muhammad's mother who's just given birth. She's reclining on a pillow and we have servant ladies here and here, and as well as here. And by the way, this scene was probably painted by an Armenian uh, artist who, who knew Armenian Christian nativity scenes. So if those groups of three individuals are capturing your attention, it's most likely because it was derived from the Magi. So there are very clear connections between Christian religious iconography and the birth of religious images of the Prophet Muhammad um, in Islam. The newborn Muhammad is swaddled in a cloth his body's contours and facial features clearly visible. He is held aloft by one of two angels, the second of which holds what appears to be a lamp or maybe a gold censer. So here's our swaddled newborn held by an angel and the second one is holding uh, this censer or lamp. This is a later inscription just identifying the scene. So it wasn't there originally. In the right register sits an old man with a walking stick this is most likely Muhammad's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, while in the left register stand a number of women, most likely his potential foster mothers. Eventually, uh, Muhammad became an orphan. Turning to the Timurid manuscript of 1425, so the successor image, a similar scene of Muhammad's birth is likewise included in Hafiz Abu's text. The painting retains the horizontal format and tripartite registers, here divided by a wall decorated with blue revetment tiles. In the center of the image, only a reclining Amina and two angels holding Muhammad and a lamp or censer remain. The lady servants that were included in the previous painting have been extracted, perhaps to emphasize the centrality of the birth event proper. Unlike the Ilhanid manuscript, whose entry comprises only two lines of fact-centered information, the Timurid text includes a much more elaborate entry highlighting a number of other details related to the Prophet's birth. And this is why I like to show paintings on the full folio rather than cropping them so you can actually get an idea of where these images are in regards to the text. So Muhammad's birth text um, goes on and on and on for several folios. So this is a real updating of an original text. So what's been added? The text relates 
that when Amina was pregnant, she received a revelation from heaven informing her that she was carrying, quote unquote, a blessed creature and the seal of creation who must be called Muhammad, a praise name meaning the praiseworthy one or the one who is praised. So actually the term Muhammad is, is a praise name. The text continues by recording Amina as having stated that she saw a light emanating from Muhammad at his birth, which illuminated the entire world. Pavilions in the Levant were lit with his radiance, which rose upwards and reached the heaven and the stars. So Muhammad's birth uh, set the heavens alight, quite, quite literally. Moving past this description of Muhammad's primordial light, the text then discusses the signs of Islam's impending ascendancy at the time of Muhammad's coming into the world. Such signs include the destruction of all the idols at the Kaaba in Mecca, the extinguishing of fire in all Zoroastrian fire temples, and the smashing of the arch of Husro, the Sasanian king. From predicting Islam's triumph over Arab polytheism and Persian Zoroastrianism, to projecting the Muslim forces military victory over the Sasanians in 637, the birth of Muhammad takes on cosmic proportions, begetting a sacred and inevitably successful course for Islam in its Persian Muslim geocultural milieu. So this is not Rashid din's text by a long shot. The Timurid painting does not address the collapse of the old world order at the time of the Prophet's birth. Instead, it takes up the theme of Muhammad's glowing light, as it is described extensively in the text proper. Here, the swaddled newborn, whose facial features remain visible despite a loss of pigment, is surrounded by an aureole, which transforms into large flames of light that branch out to the left and right of the two angels. So now suddenly, Muhammad is emitting this extraordinary light that, like a tree, branches out all over the painting. The gold pigment is further emphasized by the bright blue of the revetment tiles in the background, a color itself suggestive of the skies and thus the abode of God. Through these pictorial alterations, the Prophet's birth is no longer a domestic scene populated by earthly personages, as is mostly the case for the Ilkhanid painting above. Instead, Muhammad's coming into the world is depicted as occurring in a quasi-celestial sphere inhabited by angelic beings sent unto mankind to announce the arrival of a pre-existent, effulgent prophet. Such timorid visual augmentations of Ilhanid paintings of the prophet appear rather common. To briefly show another example of this phenomenon, we may turn to the illustration of the beginnings of Revelation, or Wahi, at which time the Prophet Muhammad was granted recitations of the Quran through the angel Gabriel. Within the Ilhanid painting, and here is a close-up of it, the Prophet Muhammad sits outdoors in a rocky landscape, his hands resting upon his knees. He has two long hair plates, a beard, and a white turban. We're told that he had really beautiful long hair that he braided, either two or four tresses and they smelled like musk or, or ambergris. As he looks towards the angel Gabriel, the crowned angel approaches him while pointing his index finger, a gesture commanding that Muhammad recite in the name of the Lord. This momentous event, which marked the beginnings of the Quran as revealed to the prophet in the form of oral recitations, was also put to picture in the Timurid manuscript. Today, the painting of this episode appears on a single folio detached from the original manuscript. And here's a close-up of it. Although inspired by its Ilhanid pre predecessor, the Timurid painting nevertheless reveals a number of divergences, including a brighter color palette, this is really radiant, a thicker application of paint, and an enlargement and flattening of the rocky landscape. Beyond these stylistic changes, one last modification can be detected, and I'm sure you've already noticed this, and that is the addition of gold flaming halos to both the Prophet Muhammad and the angel Gabriel. So the halos were not there in the early 1300s. 
In juxtaposing the Ilhanid and Timurid paintings of the Prophet's birth and the beginnings of Revelation, we cannot fail but notice a number of pictorial changes as Persian book arts developed over the course of the 14th and 15th centuries. The changes, however, involve not just style, but also content. In the case of prophetic iconography, new content is in fact Muhammad's flaming halo, a pictorial device whose philosophical underpinnings are expressed in a variety of antecedent texts. Within literary sources, the analogy of light is adopted as a consistent rhetorical device to describe the prophet's more sacred qualities. In other words, to engage the believer's pious imagination towards constructing the abstract analogy of what is known as the Nur Muhammad or the light of Muhammad. So what is this Nur Muhammad or light of Muhammad? The Quran itself mentions in several places a glowing light or a lamp that writers understood as a metaphor for Muhammad, a Muhammadan metaphor, if you will. In a number of Quranic verses, for example, it is stated that God sent a light and a book to his people to lead them out of darkness. Exegetes interpreted these verses as evidence that God communicates with humans through his book, through his kitab, that is the Quran, and also through his nur, light, that is his prophet, himself embodied radiance indicative of divine revelation, that is quite literally enlightenment. Still other verses in the Quran, most famous among them the so-called light verse or ayat al-nur, were interpreted by mystical thinkers as a metaphor for Muhammad, who is conceived of as a torch illuminating an eternal tabernacle that shines from the east to the west. And finally, many sayings or hadith of the Prophet further elaborate upon the concept of the Nur Muhammad. To give just one example here, the famous hadith compiler al-Bukhari recorded a prophet's companion as having stated that, quote, whenever he went in darkness, light, the prophet had light shining around him like the moonlight, end quote. Another hadith that is attributed to Muhammad's companion, Ibn Abbas, has Ibn Abbas saying that when Muhammad smiled, he had a gap between his two front teeth. And so when he smiled, it was almost like a torch of light um, illuminating you. So there are many of these stories about Muhammad shining light uh, in the Hadith and other sources. Through the authority of their own particular, particular literary genres, exegetes, biographers, and mystical poets helped fashion the pervasive belief in Muhammad as primordial light or luminous body derived from God's incandescent essence and emitted as creative substance into the world. These sustained efforts all coalesced to give rise to the notion of the Nur Muhammad. This conceptualization of the prophetic corpus stipulates that God epiphanized himself as light, which then manifested itself as the light of Muhammad, from which the entire universe proceeded into existence prior to the prophet's later physical manifestation on earth. In other words, the light of Muhammad begets all creation. Within the history of Islamic pious imagination, the concept of the Nur Muhammad thus highlights sustained attempts to go beyond conceptual literalism in favor of imagining a more allegorical and thus incorporeal Muhammad. Such efforts in transcending the purely physical and mimetic are echoed especially in, by paintings of the prophet included in mystical texts produced as illustrated manuscripts over the course of the 16th century, and perhaps nowhere more artfully encapsulated than in the image shown here. The stupendous painting, now on public display in the Islamic galleries of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, appears in the introductory section in praise of the prophet in Saadi's Bustan, or fruit orchard, a book that consists in stories illustrating the virtues recommended to Muslims, such as prayer, as well as reflections on the behavior and practices of Sufis, so Muslim mystics. It's a very mystical text. Here, the painting accompanies Saadi's introductory encomium to the prophet, which praises his proximity to God and his radiant light. Within his text, the author also asks how best to praise the prophet 
eventually bemoaning the fact that the written word and oral prayer will never provide a perfect or complete description of Muhammad's larger-than-life being. In some sense, then, the painting here seems to visually engage with and even offer one possible solution to this problematic by heralding the power of visual meditation. If the words fail you, then maybe an image will do the trick. In the image's upper half is depicted Muhammad as he ascends to the heavens. The Prophet sits on Burak as he flies upward among legions of angels. He is surrounded by swirls of golden clouds while a flaming halo surrounds his head and turban. Muhammad's ascension is often mentioned in the prologues of mystical works as one of his greatest miracles, through which he rose through the skies and reached God, with whom he had an intimate discussion and from whom he was granted knowledge of the afterworld, heaven and hell. As a thematic pattern, moreover, the prophetic ascension was used as a foil by mystics embarked on their own quest to go beyond the visible and earthly in order to reach Gnostic knowledge and total communion with God. As a tribute to Muhammad's highest miracle and as a metaphor for the spiritualist's own journey towards the divine, the Prophet's ascension has been a prominent theme for representation in Turkish and Persian painting both before and after the 16th century. The painting that we see here therefore must have drawn upon a number of precedents, including the very famous Timurid illustrated Book of Ascension and other single page paintings of the Prophet's ascent, which oftentimes depict Muhammad astride Barak and surrounded by angels. So Muhammad is often depicted like this, but n never above three individuals. He's just in the skies. What is noteworthy about the Met painting is the fact that Muhammad is depicted not solely in the skies or rising above Mecca, but instead hovering above three men, kneeling and closing their eyes in meditation within an enclosed interior space. One of them, wearing a green robe, a uh, red robe, excuse me, right here, seems to have fallen asleep as he rests his head on his hand, while another, who has a white beard, right here, holds a rosary and seems to be engaged in deep devotional meditation. His eyes seem to have shut slightly. Behind the three men and within a concave niche recalling the mihrab of a mosque appears a bookstand serving as a platform for the Quran. So here's our bookstand and here is most likely the Quran. From the holy text, a bundle of light emerges, so here it seems like it's almost a flame, only to beget further clouds that reach into the heavens, here, 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 thereby generating a light vision of the Prophet Muhammad himself. So we have to actually see Muhammad as being begotten from this holy text through a light source. In the intermediary zone between the cogitating mystics and Muhammad appear two inscriptions, here and here. Above the building's entrance door on the far right, the Shahada is inscribed within a horizontal frieze of blue panels, and the Shahada reads, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. As a proclamation of the faith, this creed praises the oneness of God and the selection of Muhammad as his messenger unto mankind. The second inscription on the left continues in this vein, declaring that God is alone and has no equal. The painting's inscriptional contents thus glorify, glorify Islam as a monotheistic faith, herald the supremacy and singularity of God, and attest to the divinely decreed apostleship of the Prophet Muhammad. So they further stress the pictorial contents in this way. Its details taken all together, the painting seems to portray a dream vision of the Prophet by mystics engaged in deep devotional contemplation while sitting in a mosque. As such, it offers a symbolic completion of the author's textual praise, which he himself bemoans as incomplete. With regards to dreams, the Prophet Muhammad himself is recorded as having stated that, quote, one who sees me in a dream 
It is as if he has truly seen me, for Satan cannot impersonate me." End quote. The visionary dream is therefore believed to inch closer to ontological reality, filling in the gaps created by the constraints of verbal expression. Within this framework, the painting essentially functions as an external visualization of what is essentially an internal practice of pious imagination. It's external, but it's really an internal cogitative dream. In other words, the picture is intended as picturation. It is not a literal depiction of perceived reality, but rather an inducement of a dream vision. In the process, it eloquently highlights one of the key paradoxes of the pictorial mode, in which and through which the believing viewer is challenged to overcome optical perception in order to secure a real vision of the heart and not the eye. And this is what I find really challenging and also beautiful about these images, is that you see them visually, but they serve as focalizers or prompts for a vision of the eye and the, of the heart and not of, of the eye. So you have to go beyond them. So to conclude briefly, paintings of Muhammad, made from about 1300 to 1600, clearly show that a putative ban on figural imagery has not historically constituted the principal driving force behind the metaphorical and non-figurative elements used in representations of the Prophet. To the contrary, the overwhelming belief in Muhammad as a quintessential ruler, as an invoked presence, as a primordial flux, a perfect man and a vision of the faith, compelled writers, artists, and devotees to engage in conceptual thought and as a result, to experiment with a wide variety of visualized abstractions. Paintings of the Prophet are thus suggestive rather than directive, and invite an activation of the viewer's imaginative faculty in the service of imagining both power and faith. And finally, they also challenge us, students, scholars, and admirers of Islamic art, to transcend today's pressures and presumptions about Islamic image making practices so that we may criti critically assess, reconstruct, and preserve these pictorial traditions. Without a doubt, such painterly monuments contribute in rich and praiseworthy ways to the artistic patrimony of Islam from the beginnings until the present day. Thank you very much.